The Cultural Committee and the Ross County NAACP, welcome. Ohio University Chillicothe is delighted to have you join us for this Black History presentation by Vince Robinson. Mr. Robinson is a multi-genre artist out of Cleveland, and as an established musician, poet, photographer, and radio program host, Mr. Robinson will share his experience with artistic communities and give us his thoughts about the connection between the arts and social justice movements. Mr. Robinson has strong ties with the Chillicothe community, and we're pleased to have Adrienne De Souza from the Ross County chapter of the NAACP here with us today to help us introduce Mr. Robinson. Mrs. Souza has been involved in the NAACP for several years and has been president for the past six. In addition, Mrs. Souza has served 30 years of employment at the Chillicothe and Ross County Public Library. We appreciate her help in locating this speaker and collaborating with the NAACP and providing this Black History Month event. Please note this is a two-part series, and Mr. Robinson will be returning on Thursday, February 18th at 3.30 p.m. with a panel of experts. We would like to remind you to mute all mics until after this lecture. There will be a time for question and answers afterwards, and feel free to type in any questions you may have using the chat feature. Mrs. Souza? Thank you so much, Craig, and I just want to thank um, Deborah Nichols and the Cultural Committee for reaching out to me. The NAACP has partnered with Ohio University Chillicothe for the last two years for the Black History Month program. And we are so pleased this year to have Mr. Vince Robinson. Mr. Vince Robinson is a talented multi-genre artist working and creating in the Cleveland area. He has a long list of accomplishments, and we want to highlight just a few before he begins. He is an evolving history, contributing to many artistic fields, including music, poetry, photography, and broadcasting. Mr. Robinson launched his first poetry series, Soul Poetry, at another level in 1997, while in the same year, forming a group called Vince Robinson and the Jazz Poets. The innovative music and spoken word event was soon moved to Robin's Nest, a jazz club in the heart of Cleveland and continued to grow from there. As a member of the Cleveland po Poetry Slam teams, 2003-2004, Vince competed in national bouts and published his first book of poetry got words in 2015. His poetry has appeared in journals such as the Kent Quarterly and in the Cleveland Poetry Scenes, a Panorama Anthology 2008 of Bottom Dog Press. As, as, a exhibits, as a exhibits, Mr. Robinson has provided solo exhibitions, I'm sorry, as a photographer. Mr. Robinson has provided provided solo exhibitions at Kent State University's Imagi Gallery and has participated in several group shows in the Cleveland area. He has worked permanently installed at the St. Martin's de Porres Family Center, also in Cleveland. His photography is also featured in YouTube documentaries on travels to Ghana West and West Africa by Professor Watabi Okanda. Currently, Vince is the producer and host of Open Door with Vince Robinson on Spectra Cable in Summit County and also hosts radio programs on several stations. He is also the president and CEO of Largeburg Cultural Arts, a nonprofit organization promoting healing through arts and culture. As an arts advocate, he is a current artist in residence for Neighbor Connections, a Cleveland nonprofit civic funding organization. It is my pleasure to present to you my oldest brother, Vince Robinson. Adrian, thank you so much. You know, uh, you didn't really have to look far to find a speaker, and I'm always grateful to you when you reach out to me and let me know when you need me for anything. And I'm glad to show up and I'm glad to be able to share my story. Uh, I like to begin first by thanking Ohio University for this opportunity. Um, it's 
the usually the other way around. Usually I'm the person that's asking the questions and getting answers. So I don't really get to tell my story that often. So today uh, is my opportunity to tell my story. Uh, secondly, you know, it was billed as a Black History Month lecture, uh, but I want to take a little departure from the term lecture. Uh, what I would rather uh, characterize it as is sharing. I'm going to share some things with you about my life as it relates to Chillicothe, uh, about my life as it relates to being an artist, and about my life uh, with respect to my family. So. With that, I need to acknowledge a few people. I uh, have never met one of my grandfathers. My grandfather's name is Matthew Goins. My father is someone who grew up in Chillicothe. Uh, he spent his formative years in that community. And at a certain point, his wings spread and he took off and he traveled around the world and then he came back. And in a sense, my story is a similar story, except there are a few little differences and we'll talk about them today. But one of the things that I noticed is that there are a lot of parallels between the life that he lived and the life that I am living now. And I think a lot of that has to do with his father, Matthew Goins. Now it's, it's interesting in that he never met his father and neither did I, but Last night, I received a message from Matthew Goins. And I know it might sound a little crazy right now, but I see it as I see it. And I was inspired to write these words as I received this message from him. This piece is untitled. Uh, and I'm going to read this piece to you and just let you know that as opposed to just talking to you, I'm going to give you a performance today as well as doing the best that I can to, to provide some information for you. From the coal mine to the steel mill and the spaces between, the hate of race that defies definition faced opposition from your spirit. And the line between the line between your first and last dates lives in the lines I read as I read them. And the thoughts that left a determined soul destined for this determined soul with awareness of the destinies of determined souls who live through the continuous cycles of spiraled existence outside the lines of the boxes used to define us. Lives from the lines of the many before me who through pain live successfully in spite of isms that leave minefields to navigate daily Stressfully, time builds its case against aging healthfully with taste serving as the weapon of choice in the fight for mind space in intestinal regions. But the memory stored in your genetic code continues to transmit the message that further action is required to complete the mission you were assigned at birth and so was I. And since it will continue, it must through you and those you proceed through your seed and your deeds. This is your legacy. <laughs> this is the message that I received from my grandmother, my grandfather, I'm sorry. And I realize that everything happens for a reason. <laughs> Yesterday I saw a video of a grandfather and a grandson. Mm -hmm. And it was something that moved me to tears. I was thinking about the grandfather that I never met and how mm -hmm. much I have wanted to meet him all of my life. And now I am fulfilled because I've received that communication. I want to move from grandfather to son. And that son was my father, Robert J. Robinson. I'm happy to speak of him today because I know that my standing before you right now is the evidence that he existed. Mm -hmm. And when I look at his life and I think about the subject that we're talking about today, it's the relationship between art and social justice. And the parallels between the two is the fact that they say 
life imitates art and art imitates life. When I look back at his life, I can see the similarities between the two. <laughs> and this is where it gets interesting. My grandfather, Matthew Goins, was involved in the NAACP. <laughs> and my understanding is that he actually served as a president of the NAACP. My father, having gone around the world as a military veteran, coming back to Chillicothe, became a president of the NAACP. And he served in that position for 19 years, almost two complete decades in that work. And anyone who knows anything about the NAACP knows that there's a direct connection between the NAACP and social justice. And then you fast forward some years, and now my sister, Adrian D'Souza, is serving as president of the NAACP. When I think about those similarities, I just think about the genetic code that we spoke of. And I am so grateful that that genetic code exists. Because of that interwoven genetic material, we as a family are able to have an impact on the lives of those around us. So I wanna go back and talk about my father for just a few moments and read a piece that was very pivotal in the publishing of this book. As a poet, I started in somewhere around 1975 when I took a class at Kent State University. It's called the Black Writers Workshop. And the person that my sister referred to, Mwatabu Okanta, was a graduate student at the time. I took his class, and at a point in his class, he said, brother, you are a poet. Mm -hmm. And I had written poetry as a child, and I took English in high school, and I had some favorite poets that affected me, but I never really thought of myself as a poet. But from that day forward, I took poetry seriously, and the result of it is this book. I went through a period of being this person who was observing social conditions and things that were going on in society. And I took pen to paper and I wrote them and I shared my poetry with others. But there came a point where I lacked inspiration. There was nothing for me to write about. I felt as though I had written about it before and there was nothing more to say. And then I was approached, Craig, by the Cleveland Clinic. Somebody wanted me to write something that dealt with the medical industry. And I think they wanted it to be positive. But at the time, my father was dealing with Parkinson's disease. You see, when he left Chillicothe and he married my, my mother, Ann Wilson Robinson, and they began their journey around the world, that journey took him to Southeast Asia. He served in the United States Air Force for 22 years. And while he served in the Vietnam War, he was involved in the distribution of Agent Orange. And as a result of his contact with Agent Orange, years later, he developed Parkinson's disease. My family observed what happened to my father as he navigated this disease and this sickness that came as a result of his military service. <clears throat> and when I was asked to write, this is what came. It's called Agent Orange Insurance for Robert J. Robinson Sr. SMSGT, NCOIC, USAF, WPAFB retiree, jet propulsion specialty, 22 years including NAMS, two away from wife and three, Air Force blue and green fatigues, traded places with a variety of VA hospital pastels in the drab surroundings of Chillicothe's filtered sunlight to the postmodern Lewis B. Stokes Rockefeller Park View frontline change of venue. His Agent Orange insurance plan by Uncle Sam in Vietnam, 
top secret missions in Laos and who knows where else left residuals that traveled with him for years and miles mm -hmm. since then. Opening Parkinson's door, benefits denied thrice by the same Sam he served. His survivors wrestle past grief and disbelief to pain and disdain. Records of his top secret years of service declassified seem to have disappeared. Unlike digitized entries of high fructose soybean night tube feedings and industrial grade prison food on happy faced hospital serving trays, one third eaten. Strawberry ice cream masked bitter pharmaceutical concoctions designed to slow the inevitable into bite sized morsels. Dementia misdiagnosis led to months of unnecessary medication neurologists fumbled. Turns out the nightmares and daytime delusions weren't self-induced after all. And though his body lay semi-lifeless through his last days, his mind was always racing, flashing back to memories of flights and procedures, orders given and taken, sights he cared not to share with loved ones. His hands flinched occasionally, as did the tremors that came and went. Hands that once turned wrenches and cast spinning reels. Hearts around him clung to every word he slurred, praying for improvement daily, getting glimpses of promise, complemented with more frequent setbacks. A wife, nurse, advocate, caregiver, love, emerged her life in ensuring no stone would be left unturned, no resource ignored, just get him home, her mantra. And after months of team treatment meetings and consultations, wars on bacteria, viruses, fevers, and other symptoms of affliction, he said hello to his home and the senior master sergeant's master bedroom he'd left two years prior, only to be whisked off to an emergency room within 24 hours of arrival. His government sanctioned care provider had discharged him from its care with infections that spared him from a future of futility. Amazingly, his heart remained strong while his breath departed. So gone, alternatives unexplored, now not needed. Leaving one to wonder how different a world would be if food were medicine and not a drug. If doctors were winning the game instead of just practicing, if cures were the true objective of research and profit ceased to be the engine running the full steam ahead locomotive called healthcare in America, grieving hearts and minds keep hope alive. That was for my father. And what I realized in writing that poem was that I do have something to write about. And the conditions that we deal with and face in this country every day are conditions that have largely gone unchanged. I want to rewind a little bit and just go back to Chillicothe because you know my, my memories of Chillicothe are actually very fond memories. Uh, as I said, we traveled around the world and we came back to Chillicothe before my mother and father made the decision to live there permanently. While my great grandmother, Pearl Hampton Robinson, was still alive, my father and mother were making payments on the property. And I remember the house very vividly. I remember certain things about that house. And despite those conditions, despite that situation, they're fond memories. Mm. That house on Masseyville Road, south of what you call Chillicothe right now, didn't have indoor plumbing. We had an outhouse in the backyard and there was a well in the front yard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having to go was always a challenge. You know, when you sat in that little outhouse and you smelled what you smelled and like my sister, you might have that fear that a snake might jump up and take a chunk out of you you dealt with it it was you know it was a nice memory but thankfully the house is gone and it's been replaced by another house now 
my mother tells me that despite that dynamic, it was still a very nice house. And, you know, I never had any problems in the house. And there was something that they used back then called slop jars. So I can remember what the slop jar looked like. And I remember what the slop jar smelled like. <laughs> despite that, Chillicothe was always a beautiful memory. I am old enough to remember when Route 23 was not a four lane highway. It was a two lane highway. And our house sits right now in front of what used to be Route 23. My grandfather, my great grandfather, Alec Robinson, was the owner of a farm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you know, I, I forgot to shout out Deborah Nichols because she's been very instrumental in making this happen. But Deborah was talking to me about my connection to Chillicothe. And at first, I really didn't think a whole lot about it. And then these flashbacks started to come back. And I'm like, wow, you know, I really do have Chillicothe roots. And this is just a side story. I meant to mention it at the front. Uh, I was that close to being a student at Ohio University when I was uh, a senior at Washington High School in Maslin, Ohio. I actually applied for a few different schools. I wanted to stay in Ohio because I didn't want to be too far away from my family. But Athens and Chillicothe, I think, are about an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm 18 years old and I want to exercise my grown man attitude. So after being accepted at Ohio University, I made a decision to go to Kent State University instead. And I, I went to Kent because I know that they had a, a great telecommunications program. It was television, radio and television. Now, I'm a filmmaker now. So, you know, there's a small piece of regret because I know that Ohio University has a great filmmaking program. But I made the decision to go to Kent instead. And, and the rest, as they say, is history. Honestly, I just didn't want to be home every other weekend eating my mom's chicken and greens. So uh, I decided to go to Kent instead. And um, now it is always a pleasure to come back to Chillicothe. You know, I can remember days when I would drive down 23 and I would drive past the paper mill and that sulfuric fume was in the air and you could smell it. Well, it's been a while since I've smelled that, that odor, but uh, I don't know, I, I'm wondering if, if you still smell it because I, I haven't smelt it for some time. So I wanna leave Chillicothe right now and talk to you about this whole idea of the connection between art and social justice. I became a news reporter in 1978. Those of you who might be familiar with the Cleveland area may know of Fox 8. And there's a, there's a gentleman who is one of the lead anchors in the morning. His name is Wayne Dawson. Wayne and I were actually classmates at Kent State University. And it seemed as though for some strange reason I was following him. So Wayne was working at WKNT in Kent and he was a news reporter. And then he graduated from college and he left Kent. And when he left, I was blessed with his radio job. So I began my career as a radio news reporter in 1979 in Kent. Um, so I worked that job and then eventually I moved to Akron, Ohio. And I worked at a radio station in Akron, WHLO. I was there for 10 months. Um, this was during the year 1980, it was the year that I graduated. In the year 1980, you may recall that President Ronald Reagan took office. Mm -hmm. And when Mr. Reagan took office, the money that had been allocated for a very special program to, for me to go to Bowling Green State University as a public affairs director producer was rescinded. They took the money off the table and I lost that opportunity. And then Four or five months later, the job ended. I was getting paid by the Job Training Partnership Act through the federal government. Mm -hmm. 
But WHLO decided that they were going to change their format and they went from all news because they were all news 640 to music of your life. And they didn't need me as reporter. So they said, see you later. And that's how I ended up in Cleveland. So I came to Cleveland and I started working as a news reporter at WJMO, which was an urban radio station at the time. I worked that job for a couple of years and then I worked uh, at another radio station, WERE, which was a CBS News affiliate, and I worked there for four years. But I said all that to say that my involvement in communication was as a journalist. So as a journalist, I have a direct view and direct knowledge of the things that are going on in society because it's my job to report them. I fast forward 30 years ahead because I came to a conclusion in my life after working in radio as a news reporter that I didn't want to be a reporter anymore. And the reason that I didn't want to be a reporter anymore is because I just got tired of dealing with bad news. But the irony is that I have never been able to escape the bad news. So I basically just switched my hats and switched over to describing the news through the eyes of a poet. And in the midst of all that, I'm also a photographer. So I would capture things with my camera and I use my camera as a reporter. So this goes all the way back to Kent State University in the year 1979. I was covering a protest there were students at Kent State University who were upset that black players were not being able to play the football games. They would sit the bench and other players got to play and they didn't get to play. So the students at that time decided, well, we're gonna take some action. So they organized the march. And because then I was taking photographs, I took a picture of the march towards the stadium. And that picture appeared in the Akron Reporter, which is a newspaper in Akron. So that was the beginning of me not only being a reporter, but it was the beginning of my connection with social justice movements. And I haven't looked back. So moving forward to Cleveland, I have been an art advocate. What does that mean? Well, since we have this pandemic right now, and we have these conversations about essential and non-essential workers, what has come into my consciousness is the role that artists play in facilitating healing in our communities. The photograph, the piece of art, the poem, all these different forms of art that speak to us through expression have an ability to facilitate something in us that we call healing. And from that perspective, I see artists as essential workers, even though they have been characterized as something different. Mm -hmm. So being an artist in this community, I've had an opportunity to connect with other artists and examine the needs of artists. In Cleveland, we have something called Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. It's a funding agency and they provide grants to nonprofit organizations that are involved in arts. They also provide grants to individual artists. And over 10 years ago, they created something called the, the Workforce, or it was called the um, Creative Workforce Fellowship. So what they were doing was they were giving $15,000 and $20,000 grants to artists in Cuyahoga County. And these were unrestricted grants. So an artist would be awarded a grant and they could do whatever they want, wanted to do with the money. And some of those recipients did quite um, meaningful things with their money. Um, but what happened what, over a period of time was that they gave out 161 grants and only 10 African-Americans received those grants. So there was conversation in the community when they found out about the deficit in relation to those grants, people started talking and then the organization that was charged with administrating or administering those grants had their contract removed. So the grant program came to an end. 
The funding agency, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, decided that they wanted to explore what the needs of artists were in the community. So they brought in some artists from diverse backgrounds, and I was one of the artists that they called into this conversation. Over a period of an entire year and over 100 hours that we spent together, we identified the needs of artists as they relate to the community, and we wanted to find ways that we could create some equity and the artist funding in our community. We had some very critical conversations, had some very meaningful conversations, and they were conversations that sometimes led to hurt feelings. I think there were a few times that there were tears shed, but the result of it was a transformation of the arts funding paradigm for individual artists in this community. Mm -hmm. I say all that to say, how important it is for us to be involved, for us to be active, and for us to advocate. And I'm very happy to say that as a result of involvement in this activity, we've been able to make a difference in the lives of artists in Cuyahoga County and really artists around the state. What we're looking at right now is a deficit when it comes to art funding. In Cleveland, the arts funding in Cuyahoga County, the arts funding is based on a cigarette tax. And what they have seen over a period of time is that the revenues that are generated from the cigarette taxes are dwindling. So it's representing a challenge to the arts and cultural community. And what we're looking at now is creating some type of advocacy uh, program or paradigm that can bring the needs of artists and their relationship to the community into the fold and uh, see if we can create some new ways to support artists. Recently, they described racism as a public health crisis. And I firmly believe that one of the ways that we can address this public health crisis is through our art. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to give you an illustration of how art reflects society, social justice, and the marriage between a specific genre and the civil rights struggle. This is a poem that I wrote several years ago. It's called The Forgotten Ones. And it happened because for a week, I watched a documentary on public television. It was called Jazz. It was written by Ken Burns. And they simulcast it on public radio and they were also running it on PBS. Mm -hmm. And I watched it and I was enthralled. Being a musician, being someone who was heavily into jazz, it was something that uh, I just needed to see. And it was interesting after watching that entire series, seeing the parallels between the lives of the musicians and the struggles that they were going through as citizens of the United States and citizens of the world. The name of this piece is the forgotten ones. Between every moan, every tone of a note on the saxophone, listen and hear the story of a people. From the earth shattering Blair Lewis Armstrong blue to blues infused New Orleans produced Wynton Marcellus music, tales woven into every chord, tales of strife and discord, triumph, poignant struggle and setbacks at every corner. Living in a stranger's land on borrowed time, generations oblivious to the pain that bore them into existence. It was bird's pain twisted into staccato symmetry, rhythmically wailing, yearning to be free from the pain of black America reality. 1955 segregation kicking his behind like the white horse trickling into his veins kind of pain. Couldn't escape from Parisian memories of black man humanity and coming back to New York Negro man reality again. Degradation again. And he would never be the same again. Caught a vision of Selma, Alabama, 1963. 12-year-old Negro eyes stinging from Bull Connor's tear gas and high pressure fire hose spray ripping the clothes off his back. The man is wearing a mask. The boy's flesh is a mass of sinew, of brownish, red, blood, and sweat, but I want freedom! Mm. Words 
circling in his head, weaving in and out of Charlie Parker's masterfully crafted excursions to oneness with the creator. The story is told again. This time it's Dizzy Gillespie and he's eight step eight steps ahead of the rest saying it's deep up here, but y'all don't hear me yet. And from his place in the beyond, he shakes his head and says, and you don't hear me now either. It's like they're keeping him a secret and the kitties are sucking on Nintendo lollipops and MP3 hooked up to headphones, blasting cash money tales of woe into their ears on Project Chicks, Platinum Ish, expensive whips and excessive violence. They'll never know of Ellington's elegant protest, the musical civil rights movement that opened doors for Martin Luther King a decade later. They'll miss completely the curious eccentricities and genius of Thelonious Monk stuck on Snoop Dogg and Feral Monk. They are the forgotten ones, tragically banished to a place where only a privileged few go to consume the greatness of endless oral intellectual conversations. The blues so eloquently pronounced in sound by Billie Holiday, the blues in the flawless diction Ella Fitzgerald effortlessly enunciated while she was shown the back door, shunned from dining rooms and luxury Pullmans. Her skills wielded her conviction. She would be heard still. Unlike four little girls in Birmingham who went to church for the last time when the man's dynamite ended their lives so suddenly. Mm -hmm. It was 1963. People were still being separated legally with Plessy versus Ferguson and the U.S. Supreme Court's constitutional blessing. Kennedy called for a remedy and met tragedy in Dallas in 1963. In 1965, they gave black folk the legal right to vote and ignored it in Florida in the year 2000. Coltrane must have known then what was coming when he blew his alto tenor and soprano saxophones singing the song of a people, blues people, playing in a band that created music never heard before, writing the score, crafting the door, and walking through, no matter what's standing in their path, deserving remembrance in the 21st century. And don't worry, Dizzy, we hear you, baby, <laughs> the forgotten ones. That uh, piece was one that I was privileged to perform on public television a few years later with my group, the Jazz Poets. And uh, it's, it's actually one of my, my favorite poems because of the, the retrospective. And just to create that Chillicothe connection, one winter break, I came home. This was around Christmas time. And my friend, Watabu Okanta, who I referenced earlier, had, uh, we'd been visiting each other and um, he had this jazz collection and he opened my eyes to jazz. Now you gotta realize this is during the seventies and during the seventies, you had groups like Parliament Funkadelic, you had James Brown and you had others who were really the progenitors of funk. So as a young person, I was, into funk. Some of my contemporaries were into heavy metal. I was into funk. But I met Watabu and Watabu sat me down and he said, listen to this. So it was jazz. I came home. I was told of a record store in Cincinnati called Everybody's Records. I went to Everybody's Records and I bought 50 albums. And I listened to those 50 albums over the space of my winter break. And that was my birth in jazz. So mm -hmm. I've graduated from listening to jazz to playing jazz and uh, forming the group called the Jazz Poets. I would like to uh, read something that I wrote just the other day, and it's kind of a, a reflection on some things that have happened lately. Um, I know it's controversial, and I want to have you prepare yourselves because this might be a little inflammatory, but that's what spoken word is. It is something that will provoke uh, and it will stimulate thought. So I just want you to flash back a couple weeks ago and think about what was happening in America and uh, hear this poem. It's called Hollywood Squared. From malevolent 
to benevolent dictator, dragon with 12 heads. Faces change, but eyesight failure clouds faulty vision. Won't let you see the truth, know the truth. Distracted learning manipulates the mindset. Seller bees think for thee. Bybots and have nots aspire to be bebots. Seller bees on the stage of life. Act three when you act free. Past the shackles of moguldom and crumbs for the masses, classes in transit to secondary status with the urgency of emergency that wipes autonomy clean instantly. Seller bees, iconic cyclonic industries with designer nomenclature, culture vulture influencers of starving consumers. Amazon middleman now delivers saying, say no to the store, let me bring it to your door, let your digits do the tapping while I do the wrapping and in minutes, you'll be unpacking. Seller bees, pimp butterflies and pipe dreams with ice cream melodies and melancholy harmonies. Seller bees, promote a message of hope amidst the lies that masquerade as social concern. Seller bees, some function as agents for the enemy, sliding in with a smile that masks deceit, this bump in a pound of conceit that leads to defeat with every new name RIP, snuffed with internationality, no longer a surprise, no, accepted norm, corporate gas. Knee-jerk statements mean nothing when the board of directors remains the same. Through the saga of acknowledged advantage in the continued status quo, inequity trickled down, we know what's best for you mentality, sold in bits and tasty mortals, morsels, sound bites and quotes and quotas, talking heads and synchrony ply the craft of words with verb power that disturbs cells and psyches and synchrony with the scripted reality fashioned in social distance and demonium on a global scale sold by seller bees who think for the buy bots and have nots aspiring to be be bots seller bees who think for the let them be be free mm. So as you can see, there is a, there's a small thread of what some might call anger, what some might call passion. I see them as a combination of both. But I think that it is the role of the artist to be the agitator, to be the instigator, to be the one who calls attention to the things that are going on and calls for solutions to the problems that we face. And as I look back over a lifetime of being involved in art as a poet, as a musician, as a writer, as a communicator, as a teacher, and all the different hats that I wear, I see that it's my obligation as the seed of Matthew Goins and the seed of Robert J. Robinson and the seed of Willie and Laura Wilson and the seed of Ann Wilson Robinson to do everything that I can to call attention to the things that need to be addressed in this world. And I'm extremely grateful that I have a sister who's functioning in the capacity that she is. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention my brother, Robert Robinson, who carries my father's name and has his specific mission as well. We all have a role to play. We travel in different lanes. My sister, in addition to being the president of the NAACP is also a librarian. So she serves the, com the community in several different ways, as does my brother and as do I. I want to uh, thank you so much for the attention that you have given me today. I'd like to also say hello to all of those who are watching on YouTube and Facebook. I'm hopeful that people will take the time to watch this uh, you know, later because it will be captured on the Facebook page and the YouTube page. So. Those who weren't able to tune in because they were at work or some other reason, they'll be able to see this at, at a later time. I would like to thank the students who are watching right now because I know that uh, 
things are a little bit different right now. You know, we're, we're navigating a new normal and this is a new normal that will probably change in a few months. So, you know, being able to adapt to all these things that are going on in our, in our society is a very important skill set that you must have. So with that, I want to open things back up and bring my colleagues, Adrian D'Souza and Craig Pryor back into the room and uh, ask if you have any questions that you might have or anything that you'd like to pass along to the audience. Um, I will go first, if that's all right with you, Craig. Sure, that's fine. I don't have any questions. Um, right now, I am, my heart is heavy because I am so proud of my brother and all that he does and all that he has accomplished. Um, he is just a, a wealth of information and he doesn't mind sharing that information. And it doesn't matter what it's about, whether it's health related, whether it's politics. Um, he is so multi-talented and well-versed. I am so proud of you. Thank you so much um, for being our guest speaker today. Thank you for having me. Lance, I want to thank you for taking this I time you. To with us. Um, it's been pretty incredible. And the spoken word is just, I mean, talk about deep. Some of those words, especially the ones about um, jazz and how it relates to your life and what is happening around you, um, that just really speaks not only to me, but I think the people that are out there um, that are watching this today. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, I know Ohio University Chillicothe would love to have you come in um, and speak with us once the COVID pandemic is completely over. Um, we'd love to have you there in person. And uh, I just want to thank you for all that you've done uh, for the NAACP and uh, for us in general. Thank you, Craig. I, I appreciate those kind words and I look forward to the opportunity to come to Chillicothe. You know, over the years, I've had this practice of coming home on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, and this year I went an entire year without coming to Chillicothe, obviously because of the pandemic. Uh, last year, I actually made it down on the 26th as opposed to the 25th. And uh, I just realized how special a place Chillicothe is. So uh, I, I look forward to having a reason to come to Chillicothe. And uh, it's it's always a good thing for me to come because I can connect with my mother and connect with my sister and, and my family. Uh, but it will be great to, to connect with the uh, Chillicothe community. Uh, and I'll also be transparent, you know, um, Adrian has given me other opportunities. I've been able to speak to the NAACP I can remember being at the Christopher N. M. seeing a program that they had a few years ago. Um, and it's just always a joy to me to see how the community functions and, and to see the connectivity that exists there. You know, my, my father left a legacy. And, uh, you know, my sister talked about being proud of me, but I couldn't be prouder of her to see how she has carried on his work, to see the respect that the community has for her and to see the fact that they're willing to work with her to resolve issues that, that face society. Because the bottom line is that as a globe, as a planet, we're all one family, we're one human family. Mm -hmm. And the issue is that we have all these things that divide us. And when we look at the things that divide us, we always use those as a wedge to keep us separate from each other. But the reality is that there are only very minor differences between us and that there are more similarities than there are differences. And I think in the long run, we all want the same things out of life. And then everyone can live their lives in peace, can live with the happiness that comes from being uh, surrounded by their family and enjoying their lives. The world can, and I believe it will be a better place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, um, we're gonna sign off for now. And uh, I'm going to open up the, uh, the Zoom channel and see who's waiting in there to see if anyone has any questions. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to announce what's going to happen uh, in a couple of weeks. We are going to welcome Dr. Mary Weems, Terrence Spivey, and my colleague Mwatabu Okanta 
and we're going to do a panel discussion on the history of art and social justice. Uh, Terrence Spivey is he's a he's an amazing theatrical director. He's an artistic director, and because of COVID, he had to shift from the stage to doing film production. So he just did a film that's been accepted by four major film festivals, including the Toronto Black Film Festival. Uh, this is one of the premier festivals. His film is eight minutes and 46 seconds long. And it's about a man who was murdered in Texas. And it's called The Last, The Man, I can't remember the name, but I'm, I'm gonna be transparent. It's, it's escaping my mind right now. But it's like the, the Last Man Standing. It's a very beautiful film that documents the relationship between a mother and a son. So we're gonna have some conversation about that. Uh, Dr. Mary Weems is a playwright and she's written some plays that have dealt with things that have happened here in the Cleveland area, like the Imperial Avenue murders that happened about a decade ago. Uh, she's written, done some other plays that have been featured in, in various theaters around. And she actually has a production that's gonna be a stage reading later in this month. So we're, we're looking forward to welcoming her. And then the last uh, panelist is Dr. Well, Professor Mwatabu Wakanta. Uh, Okanta and I, as we said, go back to 1975 and Okanta took me to Africa with him in 2016 uh, to document a study abroad experience that some students from Kent had. I went back two years later and then the following year for the same reason. So uh, we have a great connection. I'm actually the musical director for his performances and we'll be doing something for Hiram College next week. So um, I'm really happy to share these, these uh, these great individuals with you, and I, I sincerely hope that you will take away something from the, the, uh, the panel discussion as it happens. So with that, I will say adieu to the, those of you who are watching us on YouTube and Facebook, and we're gonna shift gears. Give me just a few moments and we will open up the Zoom chat room.